Foundation. This is an incredibly important group of people who will be um, like charging the path ahead for Falcoin, stewarding our communities, looking after governance and a number of other really critical um, parts of, of the future of the project. Um, so I'm gonna um, introduce our moderator and then hand over to her to introduce the, the amazing group of luminaries we have uh, stewarding uh, this foundation. Uh, Marta Belcher is a pioneer in blockchain law and policy. Marta has represented cryptocurrency projects, exchanges, industry associations and civil liberties groups. Marta serves as uh, outside general counsel to Protocol Labs and special counsel to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. She advises the Blockchain Association on legislation and drafted its advocacy briefs in the SEC's lawsuits against Telegram and Kik. Marta has been called a blockchain law pioneer by Forbes, has been the Financial Times Innovative Lawyers List twice for her blockchain work, and was recently named Law 360's list of top attorneys under 40. Marta is chair of the Falcoin Foundation Board and is here to introduce the Falcoin Foundation to the world. Take it away, Marta. Angie, thank you so much for that introduction. I am so excited to be here to introduce you to the incredible people behind the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Uh, I'm honored to be chair of the board. Um, and on the first day of Filecoin Liftoff Week on Monday, I gave a talk introducing both foundations and their missions, goals, and strategies. Uh, that's available for you to watch online. So I won't repeat myself, but I will remind you uh, of the two organizations' missions before I introduce you to the amazing group of people uh, behind this organization. As you all know by now, uh, Filecoin is a peer-to-peer -peer network that stores files with built-in economic incentives to ensure files are stored reliably over time. Uh, the Filecoin Foundation has kicked off to accelerate the growth of Filecoin and related technologies to create a decentralized, efficient, and robust foundation for humanity's information. And the Filecoin Foundation has a charitable sister foundation, the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. The mission of the Filecoin Foundation, the Decentralized Web, is to ensure the permanent preservation of humanity's most important information by stewarding the development of open source software and open protocols for decentralized data storage networks. Uh, and we have an absolutely incredible group of people. Um, you'll meet them today. Um, I'll be asking them questions and uh, introducing you to them here. Um, the purpose of this panel is really to, to, for you to get to know that this fantastic group of people. So I'd like to start uh, with one of our board members, uh, Rainey Reitman. Rainey, you're a prominent civil rights activist, including your work with the Freedom of the Press Foundation and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. You focus some of your work on the decentralized web. And I just want to start by asking you, why the decentralized web? Thanks, Marta. I'm so excited to be on this panel with this amazing group of people. Um, I've been drawn to projects in the decentralized web uh, specifically because I see how the centralized web is failing technology users every day. I think about how social media companies are using flawed machine learning or how you have abusive terms of service whenever you visit a website. And I think an internet that's been built for profit at the cost of consumer choice and consumer privacy isn't what we need. And instead we have to think about creating a digital experience that isn't controlled by a, a handful of tech monopolies that I think have proven we can't trust. So I think that when we look at the future of the essential of the internet and what we want it to be, technology isn't the entire solution, but it is part of that solution. And I think in the short term, decentralized alternatives can offer um, a refuge for users who want to opt out of dealing with abusive tech companies and in the long term maybe create a market alternative that pushes uh, the whole industry to be more responsive to what users actually need. And I think a Filecoin is part of an ecosystem of decentralized tools that are exploring and designing a better digital future and that our foundation is focused on steering Filecoin towards its mission of serving humanity and also supporting the larger decentralized web. Yeah, and on that point, you're, you're joining us as a board member of the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. What's your vision for the FFDW? Um, so I think that, you know, a lot of what I'm thinking is really tied to the mission of the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web, which is, I think the phrase you used was, here I have it, is a, 
commitment to the long-term preservation of humanity's most important knowledge. Um, and I, I think the only way that we are gonna be successful in fulfilling that mission is if we remember that we are not just building a protocol here, we are actually building a movement. And to do that, we're gonna have to create a community of people who have shared values and a shared vision for what the future of the web can look like um, when it is more resilient, uh, resistant to censorship, uh, accountable to users, uh, secure and transparent. And a lot of the role of the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web is working together with our community so that we can steer the protocol and the whole movement towards those values and that vision. What do you think some of the ways are that the foundation can make the biggest impact on that community? Mm -hmm. So as a grant making foundation, I think we have the ability to support uh, open source tools that are going to be the backbone of tomorrow's decentralized. Event. And we, we know this means that we can't just throw money after really exciting new fun projects with dazzling new features. Um, and I, I having worked in nonprofits and especially the nonprofit tech space for a long time and firmly committed to the idea that like powerful, impactful grant making in this space means consistent funding for infrastructure and upgrades and security on existing projects, not just chasing new projects. And um, I also think it's useful to point out that the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web actually doesn't name Filecoin in its mission. And they do that on purpose because it's not about promoting a single blockchain project. And instead, it's about seeing um, the importance of the larger file storage and uh, decentralized ecosystem, which is, you know, developers and projects, kids, and even policies that are working together, I think, to build a future that is more decentralized and accountable to users and more resistant to censorship. And I think Filecoin is such a key and important part of that. Um, but it's also part of an ecosystem. And we have to remember that we have a commitment to support the decentralized web overall. Thanks, Rainey. Um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, now follow up, I think, with Brian Bailendorf. Brian, you're the co-founder of the Apache Web Server Project, and you're on the board of Mozilla Foundation and EFF, uh, in addition to your work as the executive director of Hyperledger. What are some of the most important lessons that you've taken from your work with op other open source projects and foundations that you're going to bring to uh, your, your work at, on the board at the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web? Well, thanks, Marta. It's really exciting to be working with the Falcoin Foundation and with this really amazing community that's been pulled together. And I've known Juan for a long time and known about the project, followed it very closely, even in my role, sometimes on the other end of the blockchain industry uh, over at Hyperledger, but just really always been so impressed by by what people have been building and, and, and the impact that we can have. So I think, you know, institutions uh, require people, you know, I, I, it's it's almost like soil and green, you know, it's it, it, these open source projects are made of people, right? Um, and dealing with people is hard. Uh, and there's certainly the temptation for us to think, well, if we can just reduce it down to protocols and algorithms and software, we can avoid uh, all of that complexity, all of that model. Um, you can certainly automate a lot of it. You can certainly address a lot of these challenges. But at, at, at its heart, you know, people trust institutions when there are people and processes behind them that they can trust. And so the roles that I've tended to take on at Mozilla and EFF have kind of been the back uh, office ones like audit committee, right? You know, and things that just try to make sure that that we are the kind of institution that people can trust because we, we're, we're handling the basics right and really getting out of the way uh, of, and in, in many ways, empowering the people on the periphery to go and do something cool. So, so as as a board member of these two new organizations, I, I'd love to hear what your vision is. You know, what your vision is for these two foundations. Well, you know, I, I think the internet was built by having these human institutions that uh, really focused on uh, how do we create this the, these things that people can trust that are minimum viable governance organizations, you know, um, uh, whether it's the IETF, uh, in some ways I can, I know there's some dispute about whether they are minimally viable, but uh, um, uh, or minimal governance, right? Uh, but I, I really, it does depend on, uh, my vision is that the Filecoin Foundation can become one of these anchors in the distributed web, and that it needs uh, uh, good leadership and a good sustainability model to make that work. And what do you think are some of the ways that the foundations can make the biggest possible impact? 
Well, the funding's going to help for sure. I mean, uh, they're making the grants that can go towards software where you don't have to worry about one party, you know, uh, getting uh, uh, unreasonable benefit from that over another. That the kind of thing you sometimes have to deal with in open source projects. Being able to fund, you know, uh, this this kind of real core of the software is is certainly important, and being able to expand that beyond just the people who are protocol labs engineers or lucky enough to work for a company that is building on top of this. Uh, and I think so. I think part of that is is the impact, but I also think helping harmonize the group of people who are building even on top of Filecoin uh, from a from a voice perspective, from a community perspective, being able to explain it to the rest of the world and actually make it approachable and and I don't want to say boring, uh, but in some ways we want to make this boring so that it becomes embedded in the systems of the world. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people in the blockchain world say that we'll uh, have succeeded when uh, <laughs> when no one talks about blockchain anywhere, uh, including I've heard Sheila Warren say that. Um, uh, you know, Sheila, speaking of which, I, I think I'm going to head over to you. You're the head of blockchain and distributed ledger technology at the World Economic Forum. How are you thinking about the impact of blockchain and distributed ledgers technologies and the impact they could make on the world? Yeah, well, I think it's exactly like you just said, Marta, I and mean, I think we'll know we've arrived when people aren't really talking about this anymore. And it's taken really as axiomatic that any tech stack has a blockchain layer embedded in it in some fashion and that decentralized everything from storage to payments is just kind of normal in society. And we're just instead we're kind of innovating on top of that basic assumption. Uh, and certainly we, we hope that this effort really becomes global. So far, there's a bit of siloing going on uh, by jurisdictions. And we think that it really needs to be a much more global international effort, like I think most of us here, all of us, and certainly Filecoin perceive it to be. And what do you think the future looks like for blockchain and, and distributed ledger technologies? You know, could you paint a picture of that future for us? You know, this is kind of the, the, the billion dollar question, right? If I could do that, I would tell everyone where to put their money and their bets. Um, I think that we have yet, we just were so at the beginning of scratching the surface of what this technology can actually do. And again, once I think we've achieved that ubiquity, that kind of uh, pervasiveness of the, of the technology layer, I think we're going to get to a place where we get like all of the apps that are kind of built on top of this thing that really start to blow it up. Um, but I think there's also a bit of a cultural mindset that has to happen as well. And people have to kind of accommodate and recognize that peer-to-peer -peer going direct has a lot of advantages to it. And it's not this kind of scary thing that some people perceive it to be. Could you talk a little bit about, about those advantages? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you, every time that you have an intermediary, you're giving that intermediary power. You're often also giving them usually money in the form of fees, but you're also giving them a tremendous amount of power. And that's power, whether it's block or throttle or whether it's a control or sensor, you get there's all kinds of different verbs we can throw in there in terms of what can happen. But removal of intermediaries unlocks a lot of potential capability. And again, of course, everyone here, and I'm sure all of those chiming in are well aware that this is one of the major advantages. But what that translates into into and kind of the popular cultural mindset, I think we still have yet to see the average you know, citizen in the world understand that power and really get clear on what these intermediaries have been doing all this time and the kind of like system that's been set up and just how profoundly that affects every single one of us. Thank you, Sheila, that's awesome to hear. Um, I, I'd like to uh, go to Joe Lubin. Uh, Joe, you're the co-founder of Ethereum and the founder and CEO of Consensus. And we are so lucky to have you joining us and as an advisor. Um, Ethereum's adoption and growth, um, especially of its ecosystem, has been absolutely staggering. Uh, and that's in no small part, thanks to your efforts and the efforts of Consensus. How can the Filecoin Foundation build an ecosystem and get broad adoption like Ethereum did? Um, well, many of us in, in the ecosystem are uh, building out decentralized protocols uh, with the thesis that a lot of these protocols will link up with one another, interoperate, um, and forge uh, an increasingly decentralized internet and World Wide Web. And a big picture is uh, upon that infrastructure, the world will re-architect itself um, in uh, more decentralized architectures where, where those uh, make improvements. Um, and uh, we've been close to the protocol labs projects uh, since the start, really. And uh, there are deep parallels between the Ethereum ecosystem and the, and the protocol labs ecosystem. Um, when the, the work that uh, protocol labs has done is really remarkable. And we've supported that um, when 
thinking about the magnitude of, uh, of what Protocol Labs needs to do to be um, a very important component in, in that decentralized web architecture, um, you really have to take a full spectrum approach. So you have to think about community, you have to think about uh, crypto economics, you have to think about marketing, you have to think about attracting the best and the brightest, uh, philosophically aligned people. Um, you have to think about making investments in the ecosystem. Uh, platforms are, are um, what draws people and uh, uh, well-architected platforms grow. Um, and you have to think about enterprise. Uh, you have to build tooling for the startups, um, the revolutionaries, um, developer tooling, and you also have to make it uh, comfortable uh, to understand and onboard legacy enterprise or, or the, uh, the evolutionaries um, so that uh, they help make your, your ecosystem relevant. And you've already been doing some projects that involve Filecoin um, in your work with Consensus. Could you tell us about those collaborations? Yeah. Sure. Um, so we've done um, many things uh, over the, the years and, and we've really ramped up our activity. Um, so I'll, I'll go over it uh, pretty quickly. Um, we're currently partnering with uh, Protocol Labs running uh, an accelerator, the Filecoin Launchpad Accelerator uh, in our Tachyon Accelerator. So it's 13 teams uh, from 11 countries. Um, our diligence group, our security audit team uh, is doing a bunch of work with actors on the Filecoin protocol, uh, making sure things are uh, rock solid. Um, we have a project uh, that has been scoped out and that uh, will be moving into an implementation phase. It's a, essentially secondary retrieval mining. Um, it's uh, mechanisms to enable uh, different kinds of patterned usage uh, of the, the Filecoin system, um, different kinds of uh, device access. Um, um, MetaMask, uh, the dominant wallet in our ecosystem, and Infura, the, the dominant uh, infrastructure provider, um, are doing some very exciting things for the, for the Filecoin uh, ecosystem and technology. Infura has already been offering uh, IPFS for a very long time, uh, and uh, we're souping that up um, and providing you know, gaining access to data uh, in, in both MetaMask and in Fura, uh, we'll enable uh, a view of the Filecoin network and uh, uh, all, all the different sorts of queries that uh, uh, developers might uh, need to make or, or users might need to make in the context of, uh, of MetaMask. Um, we're building a, a storage market so that uh, people who want to store stuff uh, can uh, put out proposals, people who um, have storage to offer um, can uh, set prices, etc., and so search discovery, etc., of uh, those functionalities. And uh, uh, Filecoin has a token, it, it, or is a token, uh, and uh, that token uh, is um, going to be interoperable um, with DeFi on the uh, Ethereum network. Uh, building a bridge uh, using REN protocol, wrapping Filecoin, that's going to enable File to participate in all of the magic internet money Lego projects uh, that people are snapping together. Uh, and it's also going to enable people to borrow wrapped Filecoin and move it across that bridge uh, so that they can, um, so that they can uh, use it uh, to stake uh, and offer storage. Um, so th those are the, the main pieces of what we're building. Um, and it occurs to me that uh, one other piece that, that uh, Protocol Labs, uh, this is an answer to your first question. Protocol Labs has done extremely well and that uh, I'm really proud of uh, coming out of the ecosystem um, is building with integrity. It's building with quality. It's building uh, fundamentally and foundationally important things. And there are lots of projects in our ecosystem that actually just focus on the marketing elements or, or the extractive uh, value um, approaches and uh, um, protocol labs uh, is way up there in, in terms of intellectual honesty and uh, 
the developers know that the, the people who are, are really building uh, in this ecosystem, they're going to be attracted to that sort of quality. Well, thank you so much, Joe, and thanks for all your work already uh, on the Filecoin ecosystem. And we're so excited to have you as an advisor to the foundations and uh, to continue to work with you um, and, and work with Consensus. Uh, delighted. Uh, so next, I'd love to uh, talk to uh, Danny O'Brien. Uh, Danny, you're a prominent international activist for online free speech and privacy, including your work working on strategy at EFF and founding the UK's Open Rights Group. Uh, you're joining us as an advisor to the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Uh, and I want to ask how the decentralized web can address the important issues that you work on. Well, I think the issues that we work on at EFF and civil liberties uh, organizations that deal with the internet in general have just increasingly become global issues. They've become, they, they aren't just tied to one particular um, country or region. Uh, and so we're looking for solutions that can scale to that kind of level. And I think the lesson of the last few years has been that any centralized solution really doesn't scale when you're dealing with civil liberties or human rights. There's no solution to the problems that having such a, 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 a huge communication system and a rapid communication system and storage system um, that depends on a few companies that are literally 50 miles from me is ever going to cater to the, the, the needs and the rights of people all around the world. So I guess one of the things that I'm interested in the decentralized web is how it can be decentralized, not just technically, but, but geographically and allow the diversity of the people that, that, that now inhabit the digital world. That's, that's super interesting. And, and on that topic, you did a fantastic lightning talk earlier today as part of Liftoff Week that you called uh, the center should not hold how a decentralized storage economy can hold big tech in check. Uh, and that was that was a lightning talk. But I guess I'd, I'd like to I'd like to ask you the question, how can the decentralized storage economy hold big tech in check? Well, I have an envelope here with the answer, and we're just going to announce it here. I, I think that, um, well, the, the, the point I made in the lightning talk was that, you know, we talk a lot in, when we're delving into the technical details of, of, um, of Filecoin and other systems of, you know, proof of work, proof of stake, proof of replication. But I think the most important thing they provide is, a, is an existence proof. The hardest task I have when I talk to lawmakers and, and, um, and judges these days around the world is that they've simply forgotten that there's an alternative to centralized tech. Um, uh, when I say, and, and so they create laws that are aimed at Facebook and aimed at Google and aimed at uh, reining back these giants, but really risk just shooting the, the alternatives that will be able to successfully challenge them. So part of my um, job, I see it as, as a civil liberties advocate is being able to take um, uh, existing products like Filecoin, like IPFS, like all the many others that now exist, at least in fledgling form and say, look, you're gonna have to build the regulations and the systems around this that allow these to flourish because uh, the hope is that they will be the, um, uh, if not the complete replacement to these centralized technologies, the alternative that will keep those centralized forms in check and be more responsive to uh, consumer and citizens needs. And when you're talking to regulators uh, about that, I mean, it's, what do you say is is the importance of that and and you know what is the reaction then um i think i present it as in terms of society i think that that you know if if you've got anywhere as a politician and people have a very skeptical view of politicians but if you've got anywhere as a politician you have some recognition that the world is made up of you know big names and brands and big powerful centers of of control but also the day-to-day -day living of families, of individuals, of, of, just, of, of just everyday citizens is not like that. You know, they're not parts of the of big industry, or at least the elements that politicians should be representing in their constituents is the part of it that isn't spoken for 
by um, commercial or other um, power bases. So when you start talking about it like that, and you start talking about what Tim Berners-Lee always describes as being the web as being owned by all of us, then I think they begin to recognize that the, the laws they need to pass have to be something that protect individual rights as, as well as sort of fence in or, 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 or um, help flourish um, powerful interests. Thanks, Danny. And, and speaking of talking to policymakers and regulators, Kristen Smith. Kristen, you're the executive director of the Blockchain Association, which is one of the leading industry associations working on US blockchain policy. So, you know, I'd, I'd love to, following up on, on Danny's conversation about um, how talking to regulators in this space goes, I mean, can you tell us a little about what the current state of blockchain policy in the US looks like now? Yeah, so I think we have some bright spots, um, but it's still sort of mixed. We, um, if you just sort of look broadly at, at the crypto policy framework, uh, we don't have one sort of national framework for how to look at this. And we also have challenges in defining different types of cryptocurrencies. And, and because we don't have those definitions, we have a lot of uncertainty um, around what regulations apply and, and when they apply. Uh, but we have some bright spots. We have um, a couple of very thoughtful legislative proposals that have been introduced in Congress. We have uh, uh, thoughtful regulators uh, at the SEC, uh, Hester Peirce most notably, who has put forth a, a safe harbor proposal that would uh, go a long way towards um, helping new projects uh, launch. Um, and we have an OCC that is working to up date um, its guidance in order to to pave the way for traditional financial services um, institutions to work with um, with crypto companies and be a part of the crypto economy. So um, I do think we have some bright spots. Um, I think the big the big question mark right now is we are we have as everyone knows uh, in the US we have an election coming up and um, you know I always say that uh, personnel is policy and with issues that are this complicated, you have to have um, people who are decision makers that are in the right spots that that know about this space. And so um, we could have, uh, if, if there are changes, um, and even if, if Trump wins, there will probably also be changes within his administration, um, they're, they're the people are going to matter. And that's going to, um, you know, sort of um, either be a threat to what we want to do or provide an opportunity. And so, um, so yes, it's mixed. Let's stay tuned. And, and, and speaking about what we want to do, I mean, from your perspective, what should the industry's policy goals be? Well, I do think we need to get clarity on, on how to classify different types of cryptocurrencies. And, and um, I do think we need to get clarity on tax policy. I think we need to get um, clarity around what we do with the crypto markets and how we sure that there's integrity there. So I think I think the goals are known. Um, I think also our goal needs to be to not have anything really bad happen, um, whether it be the regulatory level or the legislative level, that that gets in the way of all of the good work that's going on. And so playing defense um, in the months ahead, I think is going to be just as important as playing offense. So how do we do that? How do how does the industry come together to play offense and advance those goals? Will they join the Blockchain Association or um, um, there's a bunch of great organizations uh, that um, help keep people educated. Um, you know, we do a lot with the Global Blockchain Business Council. We do a lot with Coin Center. Um, you know, you want to you want to stay informed, um, you know, for individuals. I, I'm, I'm also co-chair of an organization called Hodel Pack that is um, aimed at sort of mobilizing grassroots support for these causes. Um, and um, but yeah, I think that. Um, you know, congressmen and senators are actually surprisingly accessible and um, with a, a simple request, they usually will take your meeting and that the education that it takes to get an informed champion is, is a huge lift and it takes a lot of conversations um, over and over and over before this stuff starts to stink in. It's, it's not something that you can just uh, have a 20 minute meeting and, and convert it to campaign. It takes a lot of time. So I would encourage you to, to participate in the groups that are out there to facilitate this process. Um, uh, and also don't be afraid to talk with your elected officials. 
Yeah, and, and speaking of elected officials, um, I'm delighted to have Katie Biber here. Um, Katie, uh, you've been really active in the Blockchain Association and on policy generally, uh, and you're the chief legal officer at Brax and the former general counsel of Anchorage. Uh, you were also the general counsel of the Romney presidential campaign, and you were uh, you've been a board member of Code for America in addition to the Blockchain Association. And so I'd love to hear from your perspective with all your experiences in policy, how we can really make crypto more mainstream and accessible. Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. I am the least smart person on this panel, so I'm going to say something extremely obvious, which is that we can make crypto mainstream and accessible by bringing products to market that people actually find useful. Um, people did not start using the internet because they were persuaded by you know, theoretical network diagrams. They did not rip open the sides of their compact and gateway computers to learn about the possibilities of the consumer web. They started using the internet because it was practically useful for them. They could buy things like pet food. That's probably a bad example, but they could do online banking. They could buy books and music. And, and soon enough, they could do lots of things from a phone in their pocket. And that's when it became sensible for people to be attached to the internet. So the promise of Filecoin is really exciting to me because it's understandable. People immediately understand the concept of how they might use it and how it might free them from centralized options of control, especially these days when we're talking about the way big tech has a, an extraordinary impact on our lives. And what's been so interesting for me is that I've been in a lot of meetings with policymakers, with regulators, many of them actually with Kristen. And uh, I, I've told the story of Filecoin and Protocol Labs many, many times. And I can actually see in real time people developing an understanding of how this could change the world. And I think what our industry needs is just more of that more innovative ideas that people can see actually making an impact on their lives and, and things will change pretty quickly at that point. Yeah, and in, in your view, um, you know, being being in those meetings with policymakers, um, can, can you sort of respond to, to Kristen's thoughts on, on US policy and crypto? Where, where are we now and, and where are we going? How do we get there? I mean, we're, we're still at a fairly elementary level of understanding. Um, I think there are very few members of Congress who fully grasp the import of this technology. They're still stuck on how it's used for illegal things like selling drugs and human trafficking. And, you know, more and more, I think there are smart people who understand the issues on the staff level and some on the member level as well. I think it's going to take the passage of time. And look, policymakers, members of Congress are just like the rest of us. They use products that make sense in their lives. So it really goes back to the thing I said before about usable products. As soon as those things are brought to market in a way that's understandable to members of Congress, policy will change like that. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I want to go over to Georgia, um, who, uh, Katie, you were the former GC of Anchorage, and Georgia has just taken over as the, the GC of Anchorage. And, you know, speaking of these uh, tangible use cases, um, Georgia, you know, you are one of the premier, uh, really one of the premier uh, minds on the intersection of crypto and uh, traditional finance. Uh, in addition to uh, working for Anchorage uh, and being the former general counsel of CoinList, you've been called one of the top influencers in the private placement industry. Um, so I'd love to hear about, in your view, the intersections between the projects like Filecoin and the decentralized web and traditional finance. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Marta. And you're doing a great job, by the way. Um, you know, sadly, um, there really shouldn't be, in, in my mind, there shouldn't be a lot of intersections between Filecoin and similarly situated projects and traditional finance. Um, really, to me, the only intersection would be to the extent you are financing a project, you would do it through a traditional financing route. Um, the problem I think that Filecoin and many, many similar projects um, face is the initial nomenclature that was used in this space. And unfortunately, that was the nomenclature of finance. And it created a lot of connotations about the goods and services and products that could be delivered, um, which made a lot of preconceived ideas in regulators' minds about what these things were. And it really did a great disservice to the industry. And so, you know, I'm devoting a good portion of my time and 
I know a lot of the other people um, that are here today are doing the same thing to really kind of separate those ideas and those concepts and show how, you know, there are a lot of goods and services out there that have, you know, financial like features, they can be bought and sold, they can accrue value, they can be speculated on, they can um, be stores of value, and they are not securities, they are not, you know, regulated assets, and people can freely use those products. And so, um, I'm working to make analogies kind of in the other direction away from the financial world um, to really allow, you know, these projects to come to fruition and, and really uh, be used in the way they were intended to. And how do we uh, get to the place where these projects are being used in the way they're intended to? How do we make crypto more mainstream and accessible? Oh man, Katie nailed it. You know, exact. She was Anchorage first. Then I'm I'm second. I'm always second place. Um, she, it, we've got always better. Always, always. <laughs> we've got to give people goods and services that they understand. It's got to be something they can use and touch and feel, and is important to them in their daily lives. And um, I can just echo what what both Kristen and Katie have said. When we go to the Hill and we talk to people, um, it's not until we can give that tangible Filecoin example that makes sense to them. Like, oh, yes, file storage, encryption data. Yes, that makes sense to me. I could use that. I have a use case in my mind for that, that it resonates. And um, I just, that's, that's going to be the number one thing. And the education has to continue. Um, I've worked with a lot of um, kind of, startups in like non-traditional asset classes in the financial world and the most important thing is isn't actually um, trying to sell the product itself it's to educate people on what you're selling and not the not even the buyers but just the the you know the the world in general and so that's why i'm so excited to be a part of the foundation because you know i'm going to take that on as one of my initiatives is to really just get out there and educate um, as many people that will listen. Well, we are so excited to have you, Georgia, and, and so excited to draw on your experience um, as part of our educational mission. And speaking of mainstream, uh, making making blockchain mainstream and, and use cases, I'd like to go to Sandra Rowe, who's the CEO of the Global Blockchain Business Council and a founding member of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. Um, we're delighted to have you joining us as an advisor, and I'd love to hear from you how enterprises and non-blockchain businesses are thinking about the blockchain world. First of all, thank you, Marta, and the entire Falcoin team for the opportunity. I'm very excited to um, get in there and help everyone out. Um, I think this is critical. So first of all, enterprises. Well, it really depends on who you're talking about because it is the spectrum. We do have enterprises over the years that have now understood the true sort of benefits or some of the benefits of using blockchain and digital assets and are really beginning to incorporate that into their uh, existing businesses and creating new business lines. But the problem is you still have this very long tail of enterprises that just do not get it yet or have naysayers for whatever reason. And so that education process continues and we can't let up. And I actually think we should take a step back for those of us who've been in the space for like five, six, seven plus plus years, um, a lot has happened. And we've actually changed a lot of the mainstream thinking already. Think about just in the last few months, the amount of news we've seen of mainstream firms buying into crypto or they're adopting specific things in cryptocurrencies. It's been to me a journey and we're still on it. I think one thing we need to do with Filecoin is make sure that we, we message the way we want to. We agree on the messaging and then we get out there with that education piece and make it clear and understandable. That will help a lot. And so in your view, how can Filecoin really build an ecosystem that with partners that expand beyond the blockchain world? Absolutely. Um, I think it's about all of us. We have huge networks, leveraging those networks, but also I think it is about um, making it appealing to solving a problem. So what I would love to see Filecoin looking at um, across the spectrum is helping people in developing countries, um, helping governments in developing countries that don't have the access that some of the you know, more endowed resources of certain countries or institutions. If we could start there, I believe in people power and like grassroots organizational power. Um, it will start a groundswell when people are adopting in all over the world, 
um, we've seen it. it. It can happen again. And we just need to make sure that we don't leave organizations behind, especially those who have the least amount of resources and, and the least amount of sort of fairness uh, when it comes to access in the world. That's what I'd like to see Filecoin do. Yeah, and we've heard this has been a theme we've heard from others. Danny mentioned the sort of importance of this technology to potentially be um, a, a global technology and across geographic reasons, regions. And I think um, that's a great theme from today. Um, so I, I'd like to go uh, to another advisor, um, Alex Fierce. Alex, you're one of the world's leading experts in content policy and the former general counsel and head of trust, trust and safety at Medium. Uh, you now lead Murmuration Labs, which is a pro project aimed at fostering trust within distributed blockchain projects, including the Filecoin network. And so I wanna ask you, how can decentralized technologies address content policy issues? Uh, yeah, so, uh... It's an honor to be here with everybody. And I think, um, I think for me, and, and it sounds like for lots of other um, folks here, the chance to distribute decision-making and, dis and decentralize power um, among the network is gonna be promising in a lot of ways. And so one of them is people are gonna wanna make decisions about um, you know, what content they interact with, what content they're able to see or not, um, what content they want to share or host. And, um, and so for me, the chance to, allow that to unfold in a way where there's going to be a diversity and plurality of options, where there's going to be node operators and miners and a lot of other actors in the system to um, press the governance levers to say what they think is, you know, is good or is not good or is acceptable or not acceptable, um, is really exciting compared to what we have now, which is, you know, a lot of, um, you know, agglomerated power and a few decision-making uh, central companies that you know, try to respond to, to the user base, but are not able to um, to, to respond to, to, to decision making in the way that's going to be more democratic and, and, and eventually, um, I think, more legitimate as a result. So I'm trying to help build like both tools and mechanisms for figuring out what that's going to look like um, as the network grows. And could you tell us a little bit about Murmuration Lab? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think uh, I had first started thinking about the question of um, as I said, sort of a second chance to um, build uh, sort of tools and build governance structures that are going to affirmatively lead communities to um, be, you know, interact in ways that are creating trust and that are building relationships and essentially don't lead us down a path where we over-focus on enforcement and over-focus on moderation and, 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 uh, and essentially have a chance to build positive structures um, for, for figuring out what content winds up where. And so uh, Remoration Lab sort of became the vehicle to pull together folks who had worked um, you know, on trust and safety or content moderation teams and a bunch of other companies. Um, and we're intrigued by how you know, blo you know, blockchain-based applications in general and, and Filecoin in particular was going to lead to, to content applications built on top of it um, that had a lot of promise um, you know, in terms of, of allowing, allowing the user base um, to determine, you know, what what their community was going to feel like, and why the name Murmuration Lab. Oh, so I, I think when, when I first sat down with like essentially a lot of the favorite people I've worked with over the past you know five or seven years in this in this field, and we you know we like uh, you know decided we wanted to find a, a metaphor for the you know, distributed intelligence that we um, that had not I suppose already been marketed to death. Or, um, but we you know we're watching videos of you know flocking birds, um, you know. Like flying around, and so decided that was you know it was going to be a we were going to try to approach the problem also as in a decentralized manner of having colleagues who worked together in previous projects um, sort of assemble and figure out how to work on these different problems in a way that wasn't you know like a conventional company. Awesome. Well, it's been it's been such a pleasure to work with you, and I'm so excited to get to continue to work with you um, at the foundation and uh, work on these very interesting questions of content policy in a decentralized world. Um, next, I'd like to go to our fantastic full-time staff. Uh, we, you've heard already from our board members and board of advisors, and we have three full-time staff members who are just absolutely world-class um, and have been working very hard to make the foundation uh, what it already is today and what it's going to be in the future. Um, I'd like to start with Philip. Uh, Philip Banhart, um, you were an early stage investor at Blue Yard Capital, uh, where you helped uh, shape the firm's investments in the distributed web. And now you're leading grant strategy uh, for Filecoin and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized 
this web. How can Filecoin, uh, how can the foundation really make a difference in the Filecoin ecosystem with our grants? Yeah, um, well, nice uh, to be here. Um, I think Juan had mentioned in his keynote that, you know, one of like the key things that we have to come together um, and kind of work on as a community really is the demand side of the network, right? So kind of like we've, we've launched the network with all this amazing supply, but really we have to help bootstrap the demand. So from like a dev grant perspective, we have to really um, start thinking and funding kind of like uh, developers and partners who are building client infrastructure, really kind of like the essential tooling um, that kind of like makes the ecosystem more accessible for developers, um, really kind of also enable types of clients that can you know, host a lot of um, large scale data formats like audio, video, um, and so forth. Um, but we also, of course, want to continue to fund uh, infrastructure and tooling for miners. And of course, also think about documentation, education and community management as of like things that we want to uh, be within sort of like the grants program. Um, so if all of that sounds interesting uh, and you'd like to learn more, um, we're still in the final stages of the current wave of our dev grants, which is wave five, and we're still accepting proposals. Um, and uh, you can find all the information on our GitHub. Well, we're so delighted to have you um, and so excited uh, about this grants program uh, and wave five dev grants, uh, which we hope uh, you all will apply for. Um, so I'd like to go to uh, Megan. Megan Kleiman, you are the founder of 3Scan, a biotech startup that developed robotic microscopes to enable big data analysis of human tissue. Uh, you also ran an open data project in Afghanistan. Uh, and you are now, you know, a seasoned entrepreneur and a founding officer of, of the two foundations. So I want to hear from you. What's your vision for the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web? Yeah, um, and also it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I am really excited for all of the promise of um, the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Um, the two open source projects, the one in Afghanistan and, uh, and the one in biotech had very different uh, user needs, but it really um, draws into me the need for us to build out that developer community and mining community, especially uh, as many of the people here have mentioned, uh, um, hitting on geographic diversity. Because the more we can have an open source community who are able to build something uh, that is solving their own problems, um, the better off we are going to be because uh, people are the ones who understand best what challenges they have. Uh, so really building out that, um, you know, that diversity of the developer community uh, and uh, having strong independent governance, which is something I'm very excited that we're going to um, play a major role at the Falcon Foundation. Thank you, Megan. Um, and Clara, uh, you were the co-founder and a board member of the Trust and Safety Professional Association. You've been a Mozilla and Google Fellow, a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow. You're the Executive Director of the US Congressional App Challenge and the Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, and now we're so, so honored to have you as a founding officer of both foundations. And I wanna hear from you, what, what are your visions uh, for the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web? Yeah, no, absolutely. And similar to Megan, such a pleasure to be here with all of you guys today. I, I wanted to start off actually with a story. So over the last few years, similar to Alex, I've spent a lot of time working in trust and safety to really protect the internet from bad actors. And in 2014, um, I actually led an effort while I was at Microsoft working on disinformation and election security in Myanmar, where there was and still is very limited internet freedom. Um, as large te technology companies like Facebook enter the market, the government decided to actually persecute internet users for their political speech. Some are actually sentenced to over five years of um, prison or more. And the government today still continues to have a disinformation campaign against them that is fueled by 700 military officials. And it's experiences like these that really drive my vision of the importance of what a decentralized web has to offer where user data is actually um, you know, distributed rather than localized and users can actually control their data. Um, so Filecoin is such an important and critical incentive layer to allow this to happen. And over the next year, together with the rest of this incredible team, I'm so excited to be able to continue to grow and support the Filecoin community, which will continue to drive the broader community of a decentralized web actually happening. And we really hope not only to 
uh, to accelerate the growth of the ecosystem, but also, as Megan said, be able to develop transparent community driven governance so that it really is decentralized in nature. We also really uh, hope to fund a lot of research and development uh, to really solve complex problems that many people are seeing. Um, so we're so thrilled to be here. Clara, it's been such a privilege to work with you and Megan and Philip uh, so closely as we've been building up to this moment of Filecoin liftoff. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to be launching the foundation publicly. Um, and it's it's such a privilege to be on this virtual stage uh, with this incredible, incredible uh, group of people. Um, this is the this is actually the last session, I believe, of of the main stage of Filecoin liftoff week. And I, you know, we're, we're here talking about the, the future of Filecoin. Um, I, I just want to say thank you to all of you um, for being a part of, of the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Um, it, is, it is such a privilege to be here with you, and I'm so looking forward uh, to building this, this ecosystem uh, and this technology with all of you. Um, so thank you all. Um, uh, and to our community, uh, we hope you'll get in touch. Uh, you now, now you've met us all, um, and we're really looking forward uh, to working with, with all of the many stakeholders in the Filecoin ecosystem.